Modern Warfare 2, an icon in the Call of Duty franchise and perhaps, depending on who you ask, the best of the bunch. 2009 was a simpler time for gamers and especially Call of Duty fans and it was an exciting time at that. The franchise was reaching new heights, exponentially growing with each passing month, and the excitement never seemed to stop. To this day, many attribute the peak of Call of Duty almost directly to Modern Warfare 2, with Modern Warfare 3 still being the title that sold the most base units, coming largely off the incredible success and mainstream hype that was our beloved Modern Warfare 2. But we all know of the iconic pieces of the game and the appeal that it had from the tactical nuke, absolutely classic weaponry, legendary maps, and of course a campaign that was one for the ages. But did you know that it almost wasn't entirely entirely what we know it to be today. So today we're going to be exploring the untold version of Modern Warfare 2 and why it never came to be. But before we begin, I think I'd like to make this more of a series, a deep dive into the lesser known regions of COD and its history. So if you're interested and you enjoy the video, do me a favor and drop a like down below. If you want to see more, let me know in the comments as well. But Modern Warfare 2 released a critical acclaim, hot off the heels of World at War, another title from Treyarch that previous year that looked to continue to catapult the mainstream success of the Call of Duty franchise. Many fans would consider the mainstream appeal's growth to the success that was the game's predecessor, Modern Warfare, and with the direct continuation of the narrative and addictive multiplayer with richer additions to immerse the players like never before seen at that point. Modern Warfare 2 had created an untouchable sphere of hype around it. From the new additions in the multiplayer, the likes of customizable killstreaks and some legendary ones at that, to the absolutely impossible to forget classics like High Rise, Favela, Rust, Terminal, Afghan, Scrapyard, and much more, there was the easily believable notion that Infinity Ward were atop of the world, that they were the kings of the gaming industry. Except, that was only partially true. Because while the world saw the untouchable success of the studio's project, internally, a storm was brewing, and one that would hit hard. The frustrations naturally predated the incidents that made national and international headlines. Infinity Ward and Activision never really got along in perfect unison, as a lot may either consider or assume given the working partnership. Even since the launch and development of the original Modern Warfare, Activision and Infinity Ward saw some less than ideal sparks fly as it came out via various interviews that Activision wanted initially another World War II game. At the time, the very best idea to lead the first person shooter genre would have been to leave the World War II era as games such as Medal of Honor were hot on the tail of the franchise and many more were coming still. There can be a serious argument for the case that Call of Duty would have never hit the success that it had if it had not broken the cycle of World War II era games. From publicly quoted feuds and ill will statements throughout the years to even playable characters in pre launch demos of Modern Warfare 2 named Skepticism, Pessimism, and Fear, taking shots of the infamous quote of Bobby Kotick referring to taking the fun out of gaming, the love wasn't as real as the public would ever consider. But on March 1st, 2010, those subtle jabs and comments would quickly turn insignificant compared to what came next. On that Monday morning, Jason West and Vince Zampella, two of the three original founders of Infinity Ward, were promptly fired for what was labeled insubordination. As quickly as it came up, it was trying to be passed along without much public notice. The very next day, Activision announced its new strategic plans to expand the brand of Call of Duty as well as their intent to add Sledgehammer games to their development teams, though this was before their inclusion into the three-year dev cycle that we know of today. Naturally, this doesn't sit right, and West and Zampella aren't going to sit around and do nothing while their studio was taken over. They file a countersuit for $36 million, claiming there were Orwellian moves as a part of a manufactured investigation to fire the pairing. Why? To avoid paying bonuses to the pair as well as their teams. And by all first-hand accounts, it seemed that was all that needed to be done as documents alleged in contractual format that the developer has the creative authority of, quote, any game set in the post-Vietnam era, the near future or distant future, and any title under the Modern Warfare brand. The volley of lawsuits would last a little longer with both sides filing an additional suit against each other, and specifics can get long-winded, but in the corner of West End Zampella, they allege that Activision dodged paying their bonuses and wrongful termination while Activision alleged West and Zampella looked to start a coup and take top Infinity Ward talent to their competitor of Electronic Arts, who they had worked with previously on the Medal of Honor series, and their deliberate attempt to derail and stall the development of the yet-to-be-released at the time sequel of Modern Warfare 3. But how does the long-winded chain reaction of lawsuits between developer and publisher play into the story? 
It's very likely you may know a lot of what happened and how the story ends, but the untold truth behind a version of Modern Warfare 2 that the world never got to see starts in the rustling dirt of these lawsuits. Amidst the fallout, naturally the studio was in disarray. The founders being publicly put on blast by the publisher of the franchise, high-level executives leaving their post, and a seemingly, we can fill all your jobs for less statement being made by Activision as their temporary takeover the studio began, that'll do a lot on a work environment, which is something many forget is behind the game that we use to put into our disk drives and boot up daily. The games are a direct result of teams of talented individuals working day in and day out to master and perfect each individual piece of a massive puzzle that is a completed game. As the result of the fallouts of these suits, that productivity was halted to nearly a standstill for quite some time. This can be seen directly in the way of, say, expansion content, DLC map packs if you will. Now we have to bear in mind that in 2010, map packs were still a relatively new concept. Add-on content like this didn't get truly popular until Black Ops, and there were a few approaches taken before we get to the stereotypical season pass model that we think about for the era around the console generation shift. In 2007 and 2008, for the main year of Modern Warfare, there was only one expansion pack, the variety map pack including the maps of Creek, Broadcast, Chinatown, and Kill House. Come World at War, one year later, we saw an exponential growth in the post-launch content, but still not quite to where we are with our standards set by models that come years later. In World at War, we saw the introduction of DLC 1, 2, and 3, with the maps of Nightfire, Station, Knee Deep, and Verrucht, in DLC 1, Bonsai, Corrosion, Sub Pens, and Shino Numa in 2, with Battery, Breach, Revolution, and Darice rounding out the year of content in 3. Curiously, there was a fourth pack plan that was seemingly cut, with Kinodor Toten being the flagship map of that, which later became the launch map for Zombies and Black Ops. But when we got to Modern Warfare 2, we take a step back in terms of releases, we only see the Stimulus and the Resurgence packs throughout the year. Granted, map-wise, it was relatively on par with what World at War offered, though with the maps from the previous Modern Warfare included. We saw the maps of Crash, Overgrown, Bailout, Salvage, Storm, Carnival, Trailer Park, Fuel, Vacant, and Strike. Only two map packs and only six new maps. Certainly curious, but also not terribly out of the ordinary. But perhaps it came down to the restrictions on updates at the time. Modern Warfare 2 was one of the least updated titles to my recollection, and a large testament of that was just the sheer amount of modding that persisted. While Black Ops 2 is a heavily modded title now, it still pales in comparison to the amount of modded lobbies in the prime of Modern Warfare 2. Assuming you didn't get scammed of your Microsoft points, it was relatively easy to find infected mods lobbies or a max prestige lobby. Had patches gone out, those exploits wouldn't have been nearly as prominent as they were. It'd be easy to attribute the lack of updates to, at that time, the fee for pushing through and publishing a live patch to a game, as it required developers to recertify the game through Microsoft and Sony, with numbers scarcely found but ranging in the tens of thousands of dollars per every single update, which for Activision even at that time was doable but still pricey. While you could probably attempt to write it off as either of those factors, it's easy also to attribute it to the probably insanely stressful environment behind the scenes, and so for that, post-launch support was minimal at best. So there were a ton of what-ifs in life, but the one thing that we consider is the what-if of that missing patch. And as we examine Modern Warfare 2, it could have held some weight that probably would have greatly pleased the community. We do have a brief glimpse at what the world of that Modern Warfare 2 could have been in the way of old archive tweets from Robert Bowling, the former creative strategist for Infinity Ward at the time, and the man who was the face of the game and the studio as their spokesperson. If you're new to the franchise or maybe aren't as familiar with him, he was kind of like the David Vonderhaar of Modern Warfare 2, though even that comparison doesn't do much justice as Vonderhaar Har has kind of taken a step back in the public eye from being that immediate spokesperson compared to where he was for, say, Black Ops 3 and Black Ops 2. But regardless, he was the figurehead. Modern Warfare 2's largest problems gameplay-wise came arguably in the way of One Man Army, to which Robert Bowling publicly stated and rooted for the changes of the One Man Army systems. In relation to the situation, he mentioned in various multiple number of tweets things like that he was hoping to get a one-man army change in the future patch, though nothing at the time was approved yet, but it would be a preferred solution. Also, that he was looking to get rid of one-man army M203s, which were the noob tubes. He also mentioned that he suggested at the time production recommendations for the next title update if there was one approved, which unfortunately there wasn't, including again those one-man army changes. And also, that he had the MP team look into more options for One Man Army. Other referenced fixes included a patch scheduled to predate the content patch, which hopefully fixed the modding and hacking issues the game was laden with. There's one reference to that where Robert Bowling mentioned the upcoming patch will only address hacking concerns and the rock on fuel. 
no perk rebalancing sorry and the final follow-up close after the period of this response is mentioned all right guys i just submitted a list to production with my recommendations for the next patch if one is approved it includes all tweaks to weapon sites suggested by blame truth one man army tweaks to prevent constant reloading of the m203s address the rock and fuel a suggestion for ffa tweaks to help combat boosting and addresses attachments issues on certain weapons such as the silencers showing red dots i'm pushing this one hard with your guys' support i'll keep you posted unfortunately time came and went and no patch was ever approved and such things were not never adjusted in the game things like the one-man army spam persisted the fuel rock invincibility glitch persisted silencers giving away positions still persisted infinite two-shot ranges on the fal with a holographic sight and other attachment issues as well persisted those changes were never made, and again, one could argue for any number of reasons we discussed, but the iconic game, even so late into the year of support, seemed to have a second act planned, but one that the curtain never was raised for. The landscape of Modern Warfare 2 was iconic due to some of its issues as well as its amazing features, but the world never got to see that version that could have been drastically different. Or perhaps maybe even not. The patch that never happened had a ton of promise, but also could have just been bits and pieces, and that's the part we may never know. Just how much change was planned for the icon we've known for over a decade now? Will we ever even see that full story? Perhaps, but perhaps not. The prospect of the rumored Modern Warfare 2 Remastered opened this discussion up once again earlier last year, when the first inklings of that project were mistakenly posted on Amazon Italy. Since then, it seems to have been a large back and forth of it'll happen to it won't happen, but the constant that has resonated is that if it does, it'll be campaign only, to which we may truly never know. But crazier things have happened and we saw rebalancing in the way of Modern Warfare Remastered, so it certainly isn't the craziest concept. But Modern Warfare 2, a game that has been so iconic to so many, had the very real possibility of having an alternate outcome. An alternate legacy, if you will. If the full details ever emerge, we may never know, but it's certainly an interesting glimpse into the void of what if in our own COD history. And so with that, I leave you this information. Let me know your thoughts down below. Would you like to see an altered and more updated version of Modern Warfare 2? Or do you think it makes for a better story to have the what if intact? Whatever it is, feel free to let me know your thoughts down below. As well, as previously mentioned, I'd like to perhaps turn this into a series. So if you want to see more, leave your thoughts or perhaps even suggestions. If you enjoyed the video, do me a favor and drop a like down below and perhaps consider hitting that subscribe button to stay up to date with all things Call of Duty. If you want to follow me on Twitter and Instagram, those are the best places to get connected with me outside of YouTube. Practically live on both those. So if you guys want to strike up a conversation, ask me a question, whatever it may be, feel free to drop a follow. But anyways, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed. Mine is Espresso. Take care and peace.